Hello everyone and welcome to Cellular Healing TV. I'm your host Meredith Dykstra and this is episode 122. We have Dr. Pompa, our resident healing uh, cellular healing specialist on the line of course and today we're welcoming a very special guest, Dr. Barry Sears. So before we jump in with Dr. Barry, let me tell you a little bit about him. So Dr. Barry Sears is a leading authority on the dietary control of hormonal response. A former research scientist at the Boston University School of Medicine and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Dr. Sears has dedicated his research efforts over the past 30 years to the study of lipids. He holds 13 U.S. patents in the areas of intravenous drug delivery systems and hormonal regulation for the treatment of cardiovascular disease. So, wow, Dr. Sears, we're so honored to have you. You've done such prolific research in this area, and I know you and Dr. Pompa are in alignment with, um, with a lot of your work on, on fats. So we are so excited to discuss good fats, bad fats, toxic fats, cellular inflammation, and we've got a lot to talk about. So welcome to the show, Dr. Sears. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, and, and uh, Dr. Sears, I'll, I can refer to you as Barry, and you can call me Dan. I, you know, what a pleasure. You're an icon. Um, in this regard. You know, I, I remember years ago reading some of your work and uh, when you were talking about fats, and I, and I don't want to date you here, right, but that was years ago. But I, I'll tell you, you know, you took a lot of criticism, uh, you know, in the beginning. Now, you know, eh, you know, we hear a lot about what we and I talk about, right, but back then you were a forerunner, I'm telling you. I mean, when you were talking about high fat and how fat heals and you know, just a lot of your work and low carbs and high fats. I mean, you know, like I said, you paved the way. And I think you've off authored since the Zone Diet. I mean, twelve or fourteen books. Am I right on that? That's correct. Fourteen. Well, your your background is biochemistry. How for, how did you get into this? I mean, years ago, how did you get into this? Well, I actually began with the death of my father. He died of a heart attack at age fifty three. That's obviously a, a young age, but he is also a world-class athlete. Mm. And uh, also we have a family history of heart disease. All his brothers had died in their early 50s of heart disease, as did my grandfather. So I knew many, many years ago that genetically I was predisposed to an early death from heart disease. Oh, wow. I either could accept that fate or somehow try to basically change that fate. And that led me basically which led to a far greater uh, you know journey of the role of really lipids and hormones in all chronic diseases yeah. and that was really the beginning of the zone diet of you know nearly 40 years ago yeah yeah you know it's amazing <clears throat> it takes us uh, all of us a story you know to really bring us into something alternative or at least <clears throat> contrary to what's out there you know, um, in modern medicine, if you will, right? I mean, you know, to buck the system, you know, like, you know, you have early on, and um, it was the same with me. It took my story for me to step outside, you know, what normal um, healing would be. I guess I don't even know how to put it. But, you know, I tell you, one of the topics that I love and that you love is the topic of cellular inflammation. And, you know, also epigenetics. Uh, you said the gene word, right? You know, you and I both believe, right. that, hey, we have susceptibilities genetically, but you and I both believe that, hey, it doesn't mean you have to end up with a heart attack, right? I don't have to end up with diabetes. I don't have to end up with high blood pressure, although when I was in ninth grade, I had it because my gene was turned on. I'm 50, and I don't have high blood pressure, you know, so I've turned off a lot of the genes. You know, one of the things in your new work that I don't believe was in the zone diet, but you, you really talk about these three areas that really are needed to downregulate cellular inflammation. And it's three areas that I believe strongly in as well. And you also give some different tests and ratios that you can look at, our viewers and our listeners can look at on a, a blood test to really get an idea of how you're doing. And um, I agree with these markers and I use these markers and I love what you say in these three areas. And, you know, just to put them out there, and I want to break them down individually. I mean, the, the diet, and we can talk a little bit about that. And then polyphenols and flavonoids, which I, I don't recall being in some of your earlier work. And then um, omega-3s and other fats. I mean, uh, you know, just to, you know, really, I, I think we believe that it's, you know, even just even beyond omega-3s, but omega-3s is definitely, um, you know, needed today. 
So those three things, you say, hey, when we put this, these three things together, I mean, that's, you know, as I like to say, that's where the magic happens. I mean, that's what really downregulates the inflammation. A better put from your perspective, that's how you hit the zone, right? So l l let's start there. How did you come up with that? And we'll start with diet even. Well, the, <clears throat> my, excuse me, my previous background was not in nutrition. I have really had no training whatsoever, but it was in the area of intravenous drug delivery for cancer drugs. Oh, wow. When you deal with cancer drugs, if you give too little of the drug, the patient dies of cancer. Hmm. You give them too much of the drug, the patient dies of the drug. You try to keep that drug, as with all drugs, within a therapeutic zone. Not too high, but not too low. And when the 1982 Nobel Prize in Medicine was awarded <clears throat> in 1982, that I realized that you can now begin to use food, primarily initially with the fatty acids, to maintain a zone of inflammation. Hmm. We think of inflammation as something that's dangerous and evil. In reality, it keeps us alive in a very hostile world. Absolutely. If our, if our inflammatory response was too low, we'd be an easy target for microbes, our injuries would never heal. If our inflammatory response is too strong or we do not turn it off sufficiently, the body begins to attack itself. And so when we talk about the zone, we're really talking about a therapy, not by using a drug, but by treating food as if it were a drug. We're taking at the right dosage at the right time, and for how long? The rest of your life. So that was really the uh, the generation of the, the zone concept. I found that, that with time, that one, unless one controlled certain aspects of the diet, that omega-3 fatty acids by themselves would not be sufficient. Yeah. You mentioned agree. about polyphenols. Uh, when I first wrote my first book of 20 years ago, there was really no knowledge of polyphenols in the scientific literature. And that's why the zone keeps expanding, because as we get new information on how nutrients affect hormonal and gene expression, you begin to incorporate them into the overall superstructure. Mm -hmm. And in medicine, we often talk about evidence-based medicine. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? It says, show me the data. That's right. But we can use the same of principles to talk about evidence-based wellness. It's not basically looking at treating disease. It's looking to maintain wellness as long as possible. We have many clinical tests that can tell you how sick you are. We have very few clinical tests that tell you how well you are. Yeah. And so yeah. that's why I chose to work with those three markers. They're really markers of wellness. Markers of wellness that you can walk into Harvard Medical School and they will agree with you. And your goal, whatever your dietary choice or lifestyle choice, is to basically maintain those markers within the appropriate ranges that allow you to control wellness on a lifetime basis. Yeah, so we'll get into those markers, but let, let's talk about these three areas, and then we'll talk about these three markers or ratios that uh, you and I both like. You know, what, what the diet. So, you know, look, you and I both agree that uh, the average American today um, is eating far too many carbohydrates, even the healthy diets, right? I mean, even studies that I read, Doc, that look at, you know, low-carbohydrate diets, I look at the amount of carbohydrates, you know, and I see 200 grams of carbohydrates a day, and I say, my gosh, you know, it's like that to me is a high-carbohydrate diet, and they're calling it a low-carb. So, I mean, you know, what is the right diet, and what have you found with diet, just as some general overview um, guidelines? Well, I think that one thing that we have to be, uh, you know, cognizant of that, you know, calories still count. There's no question about that. Uh, but what you have to do is have the right balance of protein, carbohydrate, and fat to control the hormonal responses. So two things happen. You can restrict calories without hunger and without fatigue. If you can do that, that's the goal to a longer and better life. But that's a hormone thing. You know, the only way you can do that is if your hormones are optimal. <laughs> exactly, and that's why we have to look at nutrients as hormonal modulators. We have a very, very complex interplay. Another one has to go down. That's and right. each of those nutrients, protein, carbohydrate, fat, will affect different hormone responses. So in many ways, you have to basically say, are we all genetically the same? Of course not. No. But... 
the blood can tell us how well we're doing on an individual basis to keep those three hormones which are changing through our diet within that appropriate therapeutic zone. And if you can do that, then you're not hungry and then you're not tired. Why do people stop diets? They're usually hungry and tired. And so, so if you have to, you have, that's the Gordian knot you have to, uh, to cut. And hunger is an incredibly complex of neurochemical phenomenon that starts in the hypothalamus. So really, if we look at our obesity epidemic, much of it is due to inflammation of the hypothalamus and what's causing is distortion of hormonal signals. And as a consequence, we're more hungry, we eat more calories, and surprise, we get fatter. So again, uh, we have to look at inflammation at the really the molecular level to understand to a greater extent our obesity uh, crisis, our diabetes crisis, and our corresponding crisis in virtually every chronic disease state. You know what, Doc? It's uh, I always say, look, the the why, the reason why people can't lose weight today, or we'll call it weight loss resistant re resistance, even people eating well and exercising well, it's a cellular issue. It's a cellular inflammation issue. And you're right, particularly, I focus on what's happening in that center brain, the hypothalamus pituitary, you know, which drives the adrenals, which drives the thyroid, which drives, we know, which influences appetite and when you're hungry or not. We know that this is a key component of why people can't lose weight, so I could not agree more. This is a cellular, this is a hormonal issue, but more specifically, it's a cellular issue which is affecting the hormones, which is ultimately affecting why people can't lose weight or even control their appetite or just even being a fat burner. So we preach that. Oh, I, I agree 100%. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. So, yeah, I mean, the diet is great. And I, I think when we go over these, these three things that you look at, I, I think it'll really help people understand. It's like, you know, is the diet that you're on, you know, a factor? You know, we understand that even toxicity drives some of these markers that you're looking at. It also drives inflammation of the hypothalamus pituitary, you know, and that can even be another factor. Okay, so let's get into the topic of the polyphenols, you know, the flavonoids, and you know, because this is this is some new stuff that you know I know that you've really been excited about in research. So you know, we have the diet, and then we have polyphenols. Most Americans are really lacking this. Talk about that. Well, polyphenols uh, are those chemicals that give fruits and vegetables their color. And for millennia, that's all we thought they did. It turns out that our knowledge of what polyphenols actually did had to wait for basically new breakthroughs in biotechnology to understand their impact as gene activators. Mm -hmm. Basically, the polyphenols become gene therapy in the kitchen, wow. assuming you take a therapeutic dosage. Like a drug, you take a placebo dosage of polyphenols, you will get placebo effects. If you take a therapeutic dosage of polyphenols, you get to have some very exciting therapeutic effects. And this is what is a very exciting thing about polyphenols, as we can now get con concentrates of higher uh, levels, we can begin to see different genes being turned on depending on the intake of the polyphenols. At the lowest levels, which is still uh, far beyond which most Americans consume, they turn on antioxidative uh, enzyme genes. At still higher levels, they turn off inflammatory genes. And at still higher levels, they turn on anti-aging genes. We hear a lot about where new breakthroughs coming in from uh, biotechnology to have gene therapy. We have gene therapy right now. We just have to basically be able to use it. But the key thing, you have to use a therapeutic dosage and you have to have, again, polyphenols that actually enter into the blood. Most polyphenols do not. They're very good for gut health, which is, a, which is an incredibly important aspect too, but very few polyphenols actually enter into the blood to basically affect now the expression of our genes in our human cells. You know, and I read that in your work, and I, I want to know, like, how do we get those polyphenols? And also, I think what I read, and you can tell me if I'm wrong, at least you need at least one gram of those particular polyphenols a day. Is that correct? Uh, a minimum. Uh, that's if you want to basically begin to turn on some of the anti-inflammatory genes. So let me use some examples of what you might have to do to eat, get one gram of polyphenols per day. You could eat two pounds of vegetables. 
most Americans would say mission impossible. <laughs> of, or I could basically uh, drink of 10 glasses of red wine every day. Okay, that seems easier. That seems easier. easier. I don't know. <laughs> Some would like that. That is not easier because I have to deal with the alcohol part of that. Well, that's, well, that's true. And and now, but say, but I don't like red wine. It's too bitter. Say, okay, you only eat a hundred glasses of white wine per day. Uh, but I like I like as you know, uh, olive oil, a great source of polyphenols. Plan to drink about three liters of olive oil per day. You begin to see that trying to get polyphenols from natural sources is a very difficult process, and that's why these new breakthroughs in making polyphenol extracts, that you can concentrate the polyphenols up to very high concentrations, allows you to do this. Uh, now, you don't, that doesn't say, I'll never eat vegetables. There's a, a gazillion reasons to eat vegetables. But it's saying it's only when you get the higher levels do we begin to see therapeutic levels. Chuck cocoa is an example. Cocoa extracts been shown recently in Nature and other uh, uh, journals to have very profound effects on cognitive uh, improvement. But the effects are found at very high levels. Yeah. So again, we have to be thinking, using pharmaceutical thinking applied to food, we had to find the therapeutic levels of the nutrients which are essential nutrients. There are essential of uh, amino acids. We had to have an adequate level of protein in our diet to get them. There are essential fatty acids. We have to have adequate levels and the right balance to maintain, uh, you know, these are costinoids, the hormones coming from these. Likewise, I think within 10 or 15 years, uh, we'll come to understand that polyphenols are also essential nutrients. We have to have them in the diet, and we have to have them at adequate levels to now not affect, uh, you know, enzyme reactions or hormonal formation, the gene activation, and that's a very exciting area. Yeah, no, that's a, yeah, no, that's a, so, so, a suggestion. A suggestion. Uh, how can most people watching are going? I, I can't do that. I, I can't eat that many vegetables. So, um, I mean, are there some specific, you know, supplement choices that you recommend, or there's some specific other things? Well, there are. Some yeah, the, you know, you'll see more of these extracts. Surprisingly, uh, in terms of cocoa polyphenols, one of the leaders in the field is Mars Candy Bars. That they've put uh, many millions of dollars into clinical research to make polyphenol extracts and have published the data in terms of their ability to improve cognition. Hmm. So the, the data is growing out there. And uh, yes, Mars wants you to eat more candy bars. But they're also cognizant that within the candy bars are very low levels of polyphenols, which have all the health benefits. And if you can concentrate them up, then you have something that's more powerful than any drug because it can alter gene expression. And that's a very exciting aspect. They realize it, and a lot of food companies are realizing it, that they have an opportunity to play with the big boys. You know, I mean, a lot of people take these green powder drinks and then the red powder drinks. Well, I found them that really have very little effect on people's health. So, you know, of course, there's any claims about polyphenols. However, I don't see the, the clinical support there. What's your feeling on those things? Well, you're, you're quite right. The number of clinical studies with polyphenols that are meaningful, you can count on the fingers of one hand. But uh, I mentioned two already with cocoa polyphenols. Uh, another one that basically has recently published in terms of reducing oxidative stress. Uh, taking people who are smokers, they create a lot of oxidative stress. And uh, by giving a polyphenol extract from a, of a certain berry, which is very water-soluble, you could see within 30 days a significant reduction in the levels of oxidative stress in the blood. And when you stop taking the polyphenols, the levels of oxidative stress went back up again. So, it, you know, the data is there. And that's data you can take to Harvard Medical School. So you say, here's the data, but I have to have a therapeutic level of these polyphenols, and especially those that can get into the blood, just like a drug. If a drug is not water-soluble, it will not enter the blood and have any therapeutic benefits. The same is true of basically nutrients they had to somehow make the transitory aspect from our gut into our blood to have effects. 
And polyphenols are, again, of, you know, very tricky to work with because they have low bioavailability and a very, very short lifetime in the blood. Hmm. But if you can overcome both those aspects, you now have the ability to do very, very carefully controlled clinical experiments that are basically of, you know, have significant uh, clinical benefits that are not saying, I hope you might get some benefits. You see it in a relatively short period of time. 30 days for a drug study is a relatively short period of time. Yeah. But with polyphenols, uh, you basically, if they get in the blood, you see these significant effects, which are basically highly dose dependent. I, it, it still begs the question, I mean, how do we do it? I mean, how, you know, how do we do it? What should we, is there something we need to add? Are there more foods? that are highly, highly concentrated, we can eat, you know, what is the goal here? I mean, how do yeah, we... I, I, th I think the goal is going back to saying, what type of diet should we uh, address? Your grandmother had a pretty good feeling. Who knew she's at the cutting edge of biotechnology? <laughs> My father. She told you four things. She said that, uh, one, always eat your vegetables. She didn't say, you know, eat, eat, eat your toast you can't leave the the second thing you have to have some protein at every meal and how much about the amount you can put on the palm of your hand the next thing she said you can't leave the house until you take your tablespoon of cod liver oil <laughs> the world's most disgusting food still is but every child in America two generations ago now, now probably three had to have a tablespoon of cod liver oil that tablespoon contained 2,500 milligrams of omega-3 fatty acids. The typical intake of omega-3 fatty acids today in America is 125 milligrams. That's a 95% drop in one of the more primary essential nutrients in the body. Yeah. We wonder why our health care is out of control. So your grandmother had a very, very you know, a clear idea and because she was basically the repository of millennia of observations of what works and what doesn't work. Uh, now we basically have some research to back it up and say, you know, grandma was right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. I love it. I just took my cod liver oil right before the show, so I'm feeling really good about that. <laughs> don't feel too good because, because un unfortunately, uh, today all fish yeah. are yeah. contaminated. Contaminated uh, with things uh, like... <laughs> And the worst contaminated uh, oil, fish oil in the world, is cod liver oil. Mm -hmm. So what do we do? Well, that's why you have to now, sometimes refined is better than natural. Uh, in terms of fish oils, there is no fish in the world today that is not contaminated. And primarily with PCBs. These are chemicals, uh, which have been in, uh, were banned worldwide in 2001, but are persistent. So to get basically now the benefits of omega-3 fatty acids without the toxic side effects of PCB is to concentrate and refine the fish oils. The thing about the polyphenols, yes, you want to eat lots of vegetables, primarily for the fermentable fiber, because your gut, if your gut microbes aren't happy, you're not going to eat. That's right. But to get adequate levels, if you can't eat the two pounds of vegetables per day, and it's really not that hard, I try to do it every day myself, but if you think it's too hard, then think about refined of, of polyphenol extracts. Here's another dirty secret. Everybody loves chocolate. I know no one who doesn't love chocolate, but here's a dirty secret of the cocoa industry. All chocolate is contaminated with cadmium. And so the only way you can basically get rid of the cadmium is to concentrate up the cocoa polyphenols. And now you have cocoa polyphenols in high concentration, which are cadmium-free. Who's been the leader in that so far? Mars candy bars. <laughs> you say, who knew? Who knew that the evil ones were actually trying to basically make, make the world healthier? <laughs> well, more product, but that's a good idea. <laughs> that's so, awesome. So that's why the, and then we have to have, you know, the final analysis guidelines because everybody is genetically different. That's why I go back to my three markers of wellness. And this is not a multiple choice question. Either you're well or you're not well. You might not be sick enough to call, have chronic disease, but you're no longer well. So you look at these three markers, which look at three different aspects of your diet that can be modulated 
until you're in the appropriate range for all three. Got Only it. at that point, considered well, and by all the available criteria, probably less than one percent of Americans are well. Are running out of control. Yeah. So let's talk about the markers. So you know, we talked about the diet, we talked about polyphenols. You know, obviously the importance of you know healthy fats. You know, omega three because you know, hey, we're not you know getting a lot of these things. You know, before we get to it, I have to ask this question. What about this? These people, you know, in like I visited a tribe in Africa, right? And these people were in the bush. I was the first American white guy they ever saw, and uh, you know, they had no disease. It was a remarkable thing to see, and you know, they had just come down out of the mountains. The men went off hunting in the day. Uh, the women were, you know, gathering. They didn't ever have a grain in their life. They didn't grow. And it was really unique to see. And, you know, it really took me back and even changed my paradigm about what Americans do. I mean, these men would go off hunting. Uh, they didn't eat breakfast. They would go and they would run and they would come out and they would come back with a game and things later, you know, <clears throat> in the evening and they, they ate a big meal. You know, it's like, so, I mean, obviously they were getting game that contained high levels of omega-3 and perfect ratios, right? Um, you know, they were eating some, you know, they were gathering some different things, so there was their vegetable intake. So, do you believe they were they were hitting these marks? I mean, they were hitting these polyphenol levels because of the wild animals easier than we are today with processed food? No, actually, the, the it was the women who were doing the polyphenol gathering, and so by basically gathering of uh, you know of you know plants which are rich in polyphenols, uh, they are basically supplying the polyphenols. Animals contain actually very low levels of yeah, polyphenols. Right. That's, where, that's where the are coming from. Exactly. So so, I'm trying to fill in the blank. Here's the diet. Here's the the good fats and the perfect ratios, and then here's the polyphenols. So again, we again have to eventually go back to science. And actually, in uh, 2010, there was a very, very good article in the British Journal of Nutrition, where the the top uh, Paleolithic uh, researchers uh, basically did their uh, very in-depth analysis, to the best of their knowledge, of what the Paleolithic diet in East Africa would have been 15,000 years ago, hmm. and they came up with a, an answer about. 40% carbohydrates, about 31% uh, fat, and about 29% protein. But their their estimate of the omega the omega three intakes were between six and 14 grams a day of omega three fatty acids. Wow! Massive levels, but those massive levels would basically help you modulate the inflammatory response. That's why when you see those those uh, the the African of uh, ind indigenous people, you know they were not chronically ill, but they did age. That's why there's a difference between aging. We all will age. Sure. I, I've never seen, gone to a parking lot and seen too many cars which are 25 years old in the parking lot. Yeah. But it doesn't mean we have to have develop chronic disease. That's right. Chronic disease oh. is a consequence of uh, unrelenting inflammation below the perception of pain. No doubt. One way to address that is by having adequate levels of omega-3 fatty acids to not only lower the inflammation, but to start a whole separate process we only know now, recently, called resolution. We think of inflammation like a burning log that eventually dies out the embers. That's not true. The inflammation will continue. The turning off the inflammation is a completely different response it's called the resolution response. We have the inflammatory response right. and the resolution response. And the resolution response is 100% controlled by the levels of omega-3 fatty acids in the blood. So then, and if we don't, don't have that those levels, we can add not turn on that resolution response mediated by hormones, very powerful hormones, that basically bring the levels of inflammation back to equilibrium. So then let's look at the Eskimos of years ago, right? Um, they would. Uh, they weren't getting many polyphenols, but however, their, uh, you know, good fatty acid uh, levels were very, very high. Did it offset the need for more polyphenols, phenols, because of their incredible fatty acid ratio? The answer is probably yes. 
uh, that's one of the reasons why I, I got became interested in nutrition of, as a of, you know uh, an academic researcher because I read the early epidemiological studies coming out of Greenland and say something is odd here. Uh, you know these people are eating lots of saturated fat and they basically seem to have no heart disease, uh, no diabetes, no oh, yeah. depression, no multiple sclerosis. Okay, they're bleeding to death a little faster, but they also seem to die of bacterial infection at a higher rate. But perhaps they're, but they're getting a lot to basically stop diseases we associate with inflammation. This is now nearly uh, 40, 40 years ago, but perhaps they're getting too much that they were now depressing the immune response so they could not fight off microbial infections. So, uh, but to put all your eggs in one basket is a foolish strategy. It's saying, I'm going to put all my eggs, say it's all the fat. No, you have to bring in the polyphenols and the balance of hormones. So you have to take all of these and begin to work them around because that's why I had the three markers of wellness. It was just basically the fatty acids. That's easy. Just titrate your body, but you have to have all three systems working in sync. Yeah. To basically and to have really optimal health. Yeah. No, I, I I agree. I totally agree. So let's talk about it. So we have your let, let's start with the 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 fat ratio, the a the arachidonic acid versus the EPA ratio. I think you rep 1.5 to 3 is a recommendation somewhere around there. Talk about that marker. Well, that marker actually comes out of the of looking at the world's longest lived individuals who have legitimate birth records. These are the Japanese. And within Japan, uh, there's a subgroup, the Okinawans, yeah. which have even yeah. the greatest longevity. And that's the ratio you find in the general Japanese population and even a lower ratio but close to the 1.5 found in the Okinawans. Interesting about the Okinawans, or Japanese in general, uh, their levels of bad cholesterol are identical to Americans. Yet their rates of mortality from heart disease is seven times lower. But their ratio of arachidonic SDP, a marker of inflammation, is also seven times lower. So again, then our rush to say was the evil one that was of the problem, the very disease. Mm -hmm. So this is why I could explain why the Japanese uh, rates of heart disease is so low and explain why the levels of heart disease were virtually non-existent in the Greenland Eskimos. And also in terms of basically the African tribesmen because the levels of the of wild game would be higher in omega-3 fatty acids and much, much lower in omega-6. So they were doing by natural hunting techniques of inflammation in the blood. Yeah. Yeah, no, so that's a that's a great indicator. Okay, then the next one, of course, the triglyceride ratio. Oh, you know, triglyceride over HDL, which is one that I love to look at just to look at it really can estimate particle uh, number and insulin resistance. That's what I love about it. Two simple numbers that are on those blood tests. You can get an idea of your insulin resistance or your particles of cholesterol, which is a big deal. So talk about that ratio. Well, that, that's another ratio, and that's one that uh, you know is another easy to uh, extract one, because again, as you said, as the ratio of the triglycerides to HDL decreases, ideally under one, which virtually no American has, uh, then you start to see your LDL particles become these big fluffy beach balls, which will never hurt you, as the ratio begins to increase, you now, the LDL part become these small baseballs that can kill you. That's right. So that's one. But from my standpoint, the best the best rationale for that marker, it gives you an indication of insulin resistance in the liver. Right. And Absolutely. insulin resistance is something that is really a, a poster boy for really hormone resistance in general. The hormones wow. are interacting with the receptors on the surface, but their signal is not getting through. Yeah. And they, when that happens, everything goes to hell in the hand best. Absolutely, absolutely. So if you want to basically have, you know, if you want to have your hormones talking, all your hormones, then that reducing the ratio of triglycerides to HDL under one is your best marker. You're doing a good job. Yeah, yeah, I love that ratio myself. Yeah. You know, it gives us such a, a good 
indicator, despite looking at total cholesterol, despite looking at you know all these other parameters that most doctors are looking at. I agree with you. I, I think uh, we have interviewed uh, Jeff Olick on uh, you know a past show, and you know he he agrees you know with that marker that ratio as well. Well, this is also one of my favorite markers is the HGBA1C, which doesn't just look at glucose in the moment, but it looks at glucose over time. And I always say if you want to age faster at the cellular level than anybody, just keep elevating your glucose and insulin. <laughs> so HGBA1C absolutely is a player. You like people five and under. Hey, I even give people a little more latitude. I said at least, you know, let's try to get you below 5.4, but you like it even under 5. So talk about that. Well, you're right that the uh, you're, it's a marker of uh, glucose in the blood, but it's really a, a better marker of oxidative stress. Absolutely. Uh, we can measure oxidative stress by a number of ways, but they're not easily done. The glycosylated hemoglobin is easily accessible and through a drop of blood. People hate to give a venous puncture. That's why you have your annual physical every five years. But a drop of blood, I can do that. That drop of blood will tell you really the great extent of basically oxidative stress in the blood because it's oxidative stress that allows the linkage of the glucose and the, and the amino acids, lysine pri primarily, and you have a long-lived aspect. So if you look now at the overall most important thing, lack of death. I, I like that. It's a very easy endpoint. Basically, you see a longevity maximized at about 5.0. Now, we use that marker for looking at diabetes, but the data is quite clear. As you increase that levels from 5.0 to 5.2, 5.5, 5.8, doctors, you're normal. The blood's saying, no, uh basically a mortality is increasing. Why? Because oxidative stress is increasing. Mm. Basically now activate the genes that now make the antioxidative enzymes. And how to do that? I've got to consume a lot of polyphenols. Yeah, I, I love that. Yeah, no doubt. How about... Um, you know, I know that uh, you know when we interviewed uh, Joe Mercola, you know he he loves the marker looking at uh, serum ferritin levels, right? As a, you know something that can really drive oxidative stress. You know what's your feeling on that, and um, what would be your number on a blood test looking at uh, serum fer ferritin? Well, I think serum ferritin can basically uh, obviously is an oxid uh, a. a mediator of oxidative stress, but rather than, there's not too many ways you can lower it, other than basically taking, giving a lot of blood transfusion. That's my problem, yeah. So, so most of you say, hey, if I don't like taking the, the, the venous puncture every year, I'm not going to take a blood transfusion either. Now, that being said, uh, if you have relatively high levels, that's okay. As I say, if I will increase the intake of polyphenols. Because even though the iron in the ferritin can act as an oxidative uh, mediator, you can basically break that reaction, not by antioxidants, but again by the polyphenols activating the gene uh, NRF2 that makes more of the more powerful antioxidative enzymes. So you say, I can live with that. I know how to treat it through the diet. I just increase more polyphenols in my diet. Okay. And what does that mean? I eat more vegetables, just like grandma told me. Yeah, I mean, that, that was, you know, that's always my thing, right? It's like there's nowhere in nature, you know, we should be losing blood, right? So, you know, again, there has to be another answer, you know, that uh, we look at in nature because some people genetically just obviously run higher levels, um, ferritin levels, right? So, you know, do those more polyphenols. But now you can use a diet as a way of basically addressing and circumventing mm -hmm. a genetic aspect. Right. Just like I, I said about 20 years ago, but I'm still here because I, I've taken the opportunity to overcome uh, by the diet using the food as a drug a genetic propensity for an early death from heart disease. Right. Yeah, yep, ab absolutely. Yeah, so I mean th those three markers, I mean I, I think they're great. I, I mean I, I couldn't agree more. I mean evaluate, uh, you know, evaluating these markers I think the, the last two, triglycerides and HDL, that's in every blood test that most people are running, but your doctor... Totally free. Yeah. 
HGBA1C, easy test, right? I mean, you know, easy, you know, add that to any blood test. What about the, the arachidonic acid and the EPA ratio? You know, a little bit different. Um, you know, can they add that? How easy is it to add that? My blood tests have it, but most don't. Most don't. Uh, however, the first uh, use of the ratio of arachidonic acid EPA as a marker of inflammation was published in uh, 1989 in this very obscure journal called the New England Journal of Medicine <laughs> by some of the top Harvard medical researchers. So it's been around for now more than 25 years and is routinely used in uh, medical research. It just is not routinely used in diagnostic testing. Okay. But there are a number of independent companies that can do that for you. And if I took only one blood test in my entire life, that would be the blood test I'd want to take. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's great. So it's great, great, uh, great information, great advice. You know, and again, I think it gives um, uh, gives uh, some people, our viewers, a goal. You know, some goals to hit, you know, and some markers to look at just to gauge your health, not just a disease status. So, Meredith, I know you have questions as well. Well, I always have lots of questions. So, since we're, we're on the topic of fats, um, I wanted to go back to the, the omega-3 piece. And what are your suggestions there for a proper amount of omega-3s to take to decrease inflammation? I know we don't want to take too much, where Dr. Pompey you say we go into omega-3 dominance, but we, we don't want to have too little either. So, what are your thoughts there, Dr. Sears? Well, uh, you're quite right. We're talking about a zone. So, let's start with basically a, a pretty good starting point. Your great grandmother, when she gave your, uh, you know, of uh, you know, great uh, grandparents a tablespoon of cod liver oil. That's 2,500 milligrams, a good starting point. Now, is it the ideal point? Probably not. How do you know what's the right amount? That ratio of arachidonic acid to EPA will tell you. Are you taking enough, not only to reduce the inflammation but to activate resolution? And can you possibly take two? And the answer is yes. So again, the, that's why it uh, allows us uh, in this area what I call evidence-based wellness to titrate the individual and to titrate them so they can be optimized for their genetics. Now, some people can get in that appropriate ratio with maybe probably three to four grams of omega-3 fatty acids. That's what the Japanese take routinely in their diet. Others uh, may need uh, 10 grams of the omega-3 fatty acids. Those are very large amounts, but they are also therapeutic amounts. And that's why we have to begin looking at wellness and diet as using the same guidelines as we do with drugs. We have to take a therapeutic amount, and we can use blood to tell us whether we're getting close to that amount or not. So for the amount of omega-3 fatty acids, that ratio of arachidonic acid to EPA, is an excellent one. For the amount of polyphenols I should be taking, the glycosylated hemoglobin is an excellent one. For the control of my diet to control insulin resistance, the uh, ratio of triglycerides to HDL. Each one is measuring different things, and you're trying to bring them into alignment like the planets. And when they're in alignment, now you've known, you've done everything possible to maintain wellness for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. so do you think that cod liver oil is better than a high-quality fish oil or a krill oil? Well, cod, cod liver oil, as I mentioned earlier, is probably the world's uh, most uh, contaminated food with PCBs. Right. So I, put, I rank it pretty low on the list. Uh, krill oil is really not a fish oil. It's really phospholipids, mm -hmm. which means they can't really be purified. Uh, and it's not as, nor is it free of PCBs. Uh, because, again, uh, it does have PCBs, not as much as cod liver oil, but obviously less. The refined omega-3 fatty acids, you can get the much higher concentrations, but most importantly, with the right conditions, you can remove the vast majority of the PCBs. So I would rank them on that, on that basis of saying you'll get increasing levels of PCBs as you take more, but the blood will tell you, are you taking enough of any one of those three Will it be cod liver oil, krill, or refined omega-3 fatty acid concentrates? Mm-hmm. Right. And I said, you know, you, you said you love the olive oil. You love olive oil as a good fat. But um, what about coconut oil and MCT oil? What are your thoughts well, there? 
uh, coconut oil is, uh, again, an MCT oil. That means medium-chain triglycerides. Uh, coconut oil, I, call, I give it a, a B-. Hmm. Let's talk about the good points of coconut oil. One, it has virtually no omega-6 fatty acids. That's great because that's one of the drivers of inflammation. Two, it does uh, saturate fatty acids like uh, lauric acid, which has some antimicrobial benefits, so it's good for the gut. Okay, two good reasons why, why I give it a B-. minus. Now we have some negatives. Uh, as a medium-chain triglyceride, it will go directly uh, to the uh, liver via the portal vein. It will be rapidly absorbed through a different pathway than long-chain fatty acids. And in the portal vein, it will be burned quickly to carbon dioxide and water. But in the process, you're using up a lot of the glycogen in the liver, so you're basically putting the body into a ketotic state. And you have no reserve. It's your liver, the glycogen levels in the liver, that you reserve to stabilize blood sugar levels. So you've taken kind of the reserve out and uh, in the process of basically having the medium chain triglycerides. So that's why I give it kind of a, a B minus. I give things, uh, vegetable oils like uh, safflower oil, sunflower oil, I give them a D. So compared to a D, a B minus is pretty good. But in terms of refined fish oils, I'll give them an A. And it's just not olive oil, it's extra virgin olive oil. It's the extra virgin olive oil that has the polyphenols. Yeah. I give them a minus. Typically, so, again, you can kind of pick and choose your, your fats. Typically, the olive oils that have that very grassy aftertaste, uh, yeah, those, are your higher, yeah, those are your higher polyphenol oils, just so people know. And, uh, those, and it's the polyphenols that give the olive oil all of its health benefits. Yeah. It's not the fatty acids, it's the polyphenols. Yeah. I love a good olive oil that burns the back of my throat. It's so yeah. good. But it's, it's a very easy test, and most, most good olive oil never leaves Italy. The stuff that gets over here is, you know, the worst of the worst. How yeah. can you tell it's good olive oil? You put some olive oil on a spoon. You put it on the front of the tongue. It should taste like butter. And back to the throat, and within seconds, you should start coughing. <laughs> That's great olive oil. That's exactly right. Because it's rich in polyphenols. That's why you get the cough. It tastes like butter. It basically is low in free fatty acids. Great. But a good taste test, too, because yeah, so many of the, the olive oils on the market today are, are mixed with other toxic vegetable oils, correct? Oh, yeah. It's, it's called adulteration. It's been around since Roman times. The Romans had the same problem. Basically, olive oil has some great health benefits, uh, but it's easily adulterated. Do you have a favorite brand? Uh, in America, the... Um, uh, a brand that basically is fairly uh, accessible is called, um, I believe it, I wanted to use the right pronunciation, Lucina. Uh, you find it in Whole Foods. It's, I like that one. It's, it's a great olive oil. It's readily available. It's going to cost you about uh, $20 a bottle. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so that's a good rule of thumb. If it doesn't cost $20 a bottle, you're probably being ripped off. Yeah. Well, you get what you pay for, right? <laughs> it, all, it, it seems to always work out that way. Yeah. Well, so to kind of bring it all together, too, I'm wondering if you could kind of walk us through a day on the ideal diet that you think. I know you, there's customization involved, of course, for, for each of us as we're bio-individuals, but if you could kind of walk us through the meals uh, through the day that you think would be really a heart-healthy, beneficial from your research, uh, could you just kind of let us know what you think there? Okay, let's do a typical day in the zone, and uh, because we, one thing we haven't talked about uh, in this interview is really the importance of fermentable fiber for the gut. Mm. We don't basically feed our fiber, uh, our, our microbes in the gut. We're going to have some real problems in terms of basically uh, a leaky gut, and that leads to metabolic endotoxemia. Yeah. So it says I have to have now adequate protein, adequate uh, essential fatty acids in the right balance, adequate polyphenols, and adequate fermentable fiber. So how do I basically try to structuralize this to do this and get the least number of calories so you're never hungry and never tired? So the morning might be an eight egg white omelet. Now that's about 30 grams of protein. I'm six foot five, so I'm, that's, but that's about, you know, between, you need about 30, 25 to 30 grams of protein, but that's high quality protein. 
but it's all pure protein. And second, it's boring. So I add some guacamole to it. There's some polyphenols. Now, what about the fermentable fiber? I make a, a small a small dish, very small dish, of slow cooked oatmeal, just like grandma did. That, that's a hormonal winner. How do you know? You're lucky to watch the next five hours, you're not hungry. Now, the time to eat is when you're not hungry. So now, five hours later, it's noon. This is a good time for basically a, a, maybe a piece of grilled chicken, a lot of vegetables, and maybe a small piece of fruit for dessert. And you, if you eat lunch at 12, you usually eat dinner about 7. That's more than five hours. So at 5 o'clock, have a little hormonal touch-up. Maybe a, you know, a small piece of fruit. I need small. But I need a protein chaser, maybe a piece of cheese. At dinner, a piece of grilled fish, some more uh, vegetables, a small, small piece of uh, piece of fruit for dessert. It's surprisingly, if you can maintain, you really need to maintain peak mental and physical performance. Now, I've worked with many Olympic athletes uh, who won at this count 25 gold medals in the last five Olympics. They'll need a little more protein, not that much more. They'll need more carbohydrate and more fat. But the Olympic athletes I've worked with who have won those 25 gold medals never have consumed any more than 2,500 calories per day. The average male will need to consume about maybe 1,500 calories. If you follow those dictates, it is hard to eat all the food. That's why your grandmother said you can't leave the table until you eat all your vegetables. And for the average female, it's about 1,200 calories per day. You know, when we look at all the studies about living longer, it is the, the ones who eat less, right? You know, I mean, ultimately, you know, caloric restriction, we always say, doesn't work, right? Because you can't just force yourself to eat because when you're hungry, all of a sudden you break your, your, your meal. You all, all bets are off. Yeah, all bets are off, right? Metabolism gets mm -hmm. lower and lower. You know, but one thing that I, I love to do is eat less often. You know, I don't eat breakfast in the morning. I intermittent fast. At the end of my day, I eat far less than the average person. I don't, I'm not hungry. My body burns its fat very efficiently. I can even exercise in that state. You know, but at the end of my day, you know, again, all my numbers really good. You know, all my the numbers that you mentioned, you know, um, you know, very good. You know, intermittent fasting does this hormonal shift where you raise up the growth hormone and raise up testosterone and, you know, your body becomes so much more efficient, glucose, HGBA1C, we saw see all these things drop, right? So I like to say try not to eat less because most people can't, but if you eat less often, your body adjusts into that. But that's another subject for another day. But, um, you know, I tell you, I love your information. I thought you'd give some great advice that I think everybody needs because the, the, you can't – one diet is not for everybody. We know that. But, you know, having some of these markers to look at for people, I think it's great, you know, because it really gives us a gauge of how we're doing. You know, I think it gives us a gauge of, you know, trying to increase these polyphenols, which I'm a big believer in, you know, all the, he you know, healthy fats. And you're right, we need the saturated fats. We need this. But, you know, today people are not getting clean sources, you know, of the omega-3. Imagine people eating grain-fed meat day in, day out. You know, I mean, it's loaded with the wrong fats, the high omega-6 fats, you know, they're not getting good quality fish, and the fish they do eat polluted. I mean, so, Doc, I mean, this is what we're dealing with. Oh, yeah. it's, it's a tale of our times, and, and that's why the more knowledge your viewers have, the more they can make the right choices. Uh, the future of uh, medicine is not going for more drugs. It's going back to saying the ultimate drug, which is the food we take. And really basically going back to the beginnings of modern medicine when Hippocrates said, let food be your medicine, let medicine be your food. Absolutely. These words are still wise today as they were 2,500 years ago. Yeah, um, absolutely. So, yeah, no doubt about it. You know, and finding clean sources of these things are key. You know, I mean, uh, that's – I always tell people, look, if you just – try to eat as much organic as you can. If you just try to eat grass-fed meats, you know, your omega-3 ratios are going to be in the zone. <laughs> you know, if we're eating well, wild... will be there, but that's why, going back to what you said, is say, 
there's no one diet for everyone, but there are one set of markers, I believe, of wellness for everyone. Love that. I do. I, I love that because I agree with all of those markers. They're, they're great. So thank you so much. And, and Meredith, I'll, I'll turn it back to you. And, and Doc, you're an icon. I, I just, I, you've done so much for health. You really have. I mean, you, you know, your books, you were one of the first out there taking the hits. You know, it, you made it easier on us, you know? I mean, come on. <laughs> so, you know, we, we love you and we appreciate your information. So thank you and thanks for being on the show. So, Meredith? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Pompa. And thank you, Dr. Sears. This is such an informational show. I know our, our viewers are going to love this. So I'm wondering if you have any any words, you'd, anything else you'd like to share, and if you can tell our viewers where they can find out more about you as well. Uh, yes. Well, again, I want to thank you for the opportunity of being on your show. And uh, again, if they'd like to find out more about uh, you know the of uh, the concepts of you know really evidence-based wellness, uh, I might recommend going to one of my websites at zonediet.com. Perfect. Awesome. Well, well, thank you so much, Dr. Barry. It was a pleasure to meet you and uh, for you to just share your wealth of information. So thank you so much for, enjoy for joining Cellular Healing TV. And thanks, everyone, for joining us today. We hope you learned a lot, and I know I sure did. So thanks, everyone, and we'll see you guys next week.